And that's what we need tonight. Every one of us need to hear from the Lord. So you come, Brother Kenny, and preach for us. This is Brother Kenny Glish from around Atlanta. He's told me around three times, but the only big city I know is Atlanta. <laughs> so you preach what the Lord's given us. That's about an hour south, southwest or so of Atlanta. Uh, it is a joy to be here, about six hours from here, uh, but well worth the trip. Actually, it was more like 12 and a half since we came from Oklahoma uh, by way of Arkansas and Memphis. And so uh, it is a joy to be here tonight in the house of the Lord. And again, I want to apologize for going contemporary, uh, but you see that I do have a coat. Amen. So I haven't, I haven't fully apostatized yet. Uh, but, uh, you know, some, some people say that you're on your way once that coat gets taken off. Uh, but y'all, y'all just pray for me that I can stay on the straight and narrow. Huh. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Well, last night we began to study uh, the theology of the Lord Jesus Christ. And what we mean by that is the doctrine, the fundamental principles of the faith that the Lord Jesus gave to us uh, either personally during his earthly ministry or shortly thereafter. And we noted that no scripture is any more inspired or important than other scripture. It is all the word of God. Amen. Uh, but there are some things that we Consider in a special way become, because they come to us directly from the lips of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so last night, we looked at what Jesus believes about God. And we Amen. studied that there from Revelation chapter number 1 as he revealed himself to the Apostle John. And tonight, Lord willing, my desire is to study this thing of what Jesus believes about the church. What does Jesus believe Amen. about the church? And unless God changes our train of thought, tomorrow night we'll be looking at what Jesus believes about redemption. Uh, so I want to ask you to turn tonight to a very familiar portion of Scripture. I'm sure some of you already know where this is heading. Turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter number 16. This, of course, is... Uh, that portion of scripture where the Lord Jesus speaks directly concerning the building of the church. And, and though this is familiar to many of you here tonight, uh, I would point out that such a mountain peak passage as this demands our coming back to it time Amen. and time again, Amen. unless we forget the glorious truths here presented. And uh, you're going to have to bear with me tonight because this is an area that uh, I am very passionate about, uh, that I think is very, very important, uh, especially so uh, when you consider uh, the state that the church is in today. Right. Uh, I think that uh, the reason that we are losing the younger generation uh, is, yes, a failure to preach Christ as he is, uh, but the reason that we're losing them from the appointed means of serving God, who which is the church, is because we have shied away from emphasizing and preaching these truths. Amen. And what better occasion to come and feast our eyes and feast our hearts on such a monumental portion of God's Word than here tonight as we commemorate the 20th anniversary of New Testament Baptist Church. Amen. So if you are there in Matthew chapter number 16, I'm going to begin reading at verse 13. And when you found your place, if you would, stand in honor of God's word, and we'll read together. The Bible says, Matthew chapter number 16, verse 13. When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, Some say that thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He saith unto them, But whom say ye that I am? Amen. And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Amen. And we all just stop right there and say, Amen. Amen. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father, which is in heaven. Amen. And I say also unto thee, that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell 
shall not prevail against it. Father, we thank you tonight for the privilege to gather together as your body, your called out assembly from among uh, a lost and dying world. You have regenerated us, you have saved us, you have added us into the family of God, and you have added us uh, into the church of God. And Lord, tonight we want to study this important uh, but widely forgotten portion of scripture and truth that is in your word. I ask you your blessing upon the message tonight. May it encourage us to stand zealous for the truth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Here in this text, for the very first time, our Lord Jesus Christ announces the building of his church. Amen. And he promises to build his assembly. And may I submit to you tonight uh, that we are here because of this promise that our Lord made some 2,000 years ago. Amen. But we are the benefactors of this integral work in the ministry of the Lord Jesus. And what is taking place here in Matthew 16 is a monumental transition within redemptive history. You see, very soon Jesus Christ would go to the cross and he would forever ratify right. the new covenant. Yeah. Now this meant that the Old Testament sacrificial system and the Old Covenant temple were to be fulfilled. They were to find their culmination in the sacrifice of Christ and in his appointed means of worship, which is the church. Yeah. And no more is the nation of Israel the visible manifestation of God's kingdom, uh, but now it is the church, which is the embassy of the kingdom of heaven. Yeah. And we must never overlook the implications of what our Lord is promising here. Amen. Uh, Jesus is exalting his church as the program of God in the new covenant. An Israelite could not faithfully serve Jehovah apart from the temple. And though it is an unpopular truth, a New Testament Christian cannot properly serve God the way that he has prescribed them to serve him apart from the New Testament church. Amen. The centrality of the Lord's church to the service and work of God cannot be overstated in our day. And this message is pivotal in our day and age in which we live as it is something that is often neglected, something that is far too often undermined, uh, something that is replaced by the traditions and the thoughts of men uh, and is taken away from the truth that is in the Word of God. Amen. And here our Lord reveals to us the history, nature, doctrine, and perseverance of His church. This Amen. is a jam-packed portion of Scripture. And tonight, my burden is... Uh, not to correct the Protestant error that has been taught. Uh, I, I glory to God tonight that I'm talking to a group of people that, to my knowledge, are pretty familiar with what I'm saying. Amen. And I thank God for that. And uh, we're going to find out later that it's not because there's any inherent goodness in us, but because the Lord has revealed these truths to us. Amen. Uh, but what, what my burden is tonight is the fact, if I may say this as kindly as I know how, uh, when I go off to Bible conferences, when I go to preach at meetings, uh, I see a lot of what the Bible calls as hoary heads. And I thank God for that, for I learn from them, and I sit under them, uh, but when I look around at my own generation, uh, I find them rather going off to some pagan fun center, right. rather going off uh, to worship the Lord as their own feelings and emotions dictate is right, right. And, and I don't see them committing themselves to the Lord's church. Amen. And so I ask myself, well, why is that? Well, I think largely it is because we have failed to emphasize and preach these truths. Amen. These used to be some of the things that we were known as. Amen. These used to be some of our distinctives that we would not think about compromising on. Uh, these used to be the very identity of who we were to the world and Amen. to other Christians and other believers. Uh, these truths used to be so important to us uh, that we would rather be put to death than forsake what the Lord teaches us. Right. Amen. Uh, but we have turned the blessing of religious freedom into a curse. And let me say it is a blessing. I'm 
thankful tonight. I believe that it is by the providence of God uh, that we are still not, in America at least, put to death for believing these things. But what this has done to us, it has caused us uh, to have forgotten who we are and where we came from, and we have compromised uh, the convictions that were once near and dear in order to gain the approval of men and groups that have historically right. hated and persecuted us. You're right. See, when a Baptist compromises with Protestants, it never harms the Protestants. You're right. It's never the Protestants that adopts the Baptist distinctives. It's always the Baptist that goes and adopts the Protestant You're right. Distinctive. Amen. Yeah. We have quit asking the question, what does the Lord believe about the church? And we are now asking the question of what is acceptable in the eyes of men for us to believe about the church. We want to be uh, just as much Baptist as we can be before we start stepping on toes. Mm. And we have sacrificed our once cherished distinctives on the ecumenical altar of acceptance and popularity. Right. And we have sold our birthright for a mess of Protestant pottage. Right. And as a result of no longer teaching these historical distinctives, we have failed to provide our congregations with a firm foundation for our beliefs. And Amen. Us, you You're see, right. they know well, you must be baptized by immersion, uh, but they don't understand why. And so when a group comes by and says, well, you don't have to be baptized by immersion to join our uh, group. Oh, uh, well, they don't understand the error in that. Uh, they understand that we have historically believed in the plenary and verbal inspiration of the received text, which has been translated into the King James Bible, uh, but they don't know why right. we believe that. And right. so uh, when some group comes off with a uh, hot off the press corruption of God's word, uh, they go hook, line, and sinker yep. into it. Uh, they know that when we observe the Lord's table, we have specific elements. Amen. We have a specific setting. Right. Uh, we, don't, we don't do it uh, at will with our families. Uh, I think uh, the coronavirus and all that's going on has really revealed the, the state of ecclesiology in those that profess Christianity You're in right. America. Amen. Uh, it's an absolute joke to think that you can uh, go off to the grocery store and buy some saltine crackers and some Welch's grape juice and sit on the couch with your family and call it the Lord's table. Lord help us. That's no better than the Corinthians. Amen. Yeah. Oh, but don't you dare question it. You're just a legalist. No, I'm just someone who cares about what Jesus thinks about Amen. the church. Amen. Mm -hmm. And what was commonly taught and believed amongst professing Baptists is now scarce and hard to find. You see, we're having to call ourselves by our own distinctives. I mean, why do we have to call ourselves independent Baptists? That's the only kind of true Baptists there are. Right. But why do we have to call ourselves missionary Baptists? There's no other kind of Baptist than a missionary Amen. Baptist. You know, you, you say that, that I sound funny with, with what I'm about to say, but I honestly will not be surprised if in my lifetime we're going to have to start calling ourselves immersing Baptists. Yeah, <laughs> probably. And we laugh, and it's funny. But who would have ever thought that we would have come this far? Right. Yeah. I, I wish we could just call ourselves the church. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but we need these distinctives. Amen. And as far as I'm concerned, men that this world is not worthy of have held to these names mm -hmm. and these distinctives. And I consider it an honor that my Lord has privileged me to be called the same name as them. Amen. Mm -hmm. So let's examine tonight why this doctrine is indeed so essential and why we must continue to preach it. And let us not ask the question, what do the creeds say about the church? Or what do the confessions say about the church? Or what do the supposed church fathers say about the church? And God forbid we should ask, what do the reformers say about the right. church? Amen. But tonight, let us somberly consider, what does Jesus believe? about the church. Amen. The first thing from this text I want you to see is that Jesus believed that there were some founding principles for the church. Amen. I want you to look here. He asks the question, whom do men say that I am? And they, they begin to give him these answers. But that really wasn't the question that the Lord was too concerned about. 
The question he was really concerned about was the one that he asked uh, there in verse 15 when he said to his disciple, whom say ye Amen. that I am? Amen. Well, we know what the world believes about Christ. They don't yeah. believe he's the Son of God. Okay. Uh, they don't believe that he's the Savior. That's why they're lost. Mm -hmm. But he wants to know, what do you, you who profess yourself to be a Christian, what think ye of Christ? And, you know, we often beat up Peter, and we like to gang up on him and berate him uh, for his uncanny ability to stick his foot in his mouth. Okay. However, his answer to Jesus' question here Amen. could not have been more correct. Amen. Who said ye that I am? And Peter said, well, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Amen. Amen. And I want you to notice two things. Peter said, first of all, thou art the Christ. You see, Jesus is the promised Christ. He is the Messiah that was to come to deliver us from our sins. He is the one whom the prophets had written about. He is the anointed one of God. He is the Savior of his people. But, but also, he is the Son of the living God. He is the eternal second person of the Holy Trinity. That Jesus Christ does not exist as if he is something that came out of something else, uh, but he rather is pure and simple Amen. being. He depends upon absolutely nothing. Amen. God does not exist. He subsists within the blessedness of his three persons. Amen. And he possesses the totality of all of the divine attributes, and in the Lord Jesus, the full uh, body or the fullness of the Godhead, Godhead dwelt bodily. And Peter understood these truths. And it wasn't because of his own intellectual prowess, but it was as Jesus said, Blessed art thou, Simon bar Jonah, for flesh and blood hath not revealed the Amen. Oh, but my Father, which is in heaven. Now I want you to put two and two together here, because Jesus asked this question, and then the very next thing he says is, I say also unto thee, thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. Well, what does that mean? Well, that means that Jesus' church is founded upon a proper understanding of who he is and Amen. what he has done. Uh, the Lord's church is not based on the stories of men, but, but on a divine revelation Amen. of Jesus Christ as the Son of the living God. And any church that has any other Jesus is no church at all. Nor is anyone a fit candidate for membership in this church who has not placed their faith in this true confession. Mm -hmm. The first founding principle is that there is a true confession that we must have. Well, if you must believe this true confession to be a part of this church, what does that mean? Well, that means that by necessity, we must have a regenerate church Amen. membership. Amen. The Apostle Paul said... Not all Israel is of Israel. And I want to say to you tonight that not all church is of this church. Amen. You need not be intellectual. You need not be wealthy. Amen. You need not be well liked in the community. But you must be born again to be Amen. part of this Amen. church. Amen. The prerequisite of baptism is not the faith of your parents. As some would have us to believe. It is not the church that you were born into, as some would teach. But it is your own faith that matters. And you must believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And I don't care Amen. if you were raised up on this church pew. I don't care if you're a, a PK. Uh, because most PKs in a lot of these Baptist churches are, are just as lost as some wicked sinner that's Amen. never heard the gospel. I don't care if your name's on the road. Amen. Your church membership, uh, you might have us fooled, you might have a, it written down on a piece of paper, but to the Lord of the church, it means absolutely nothing. You must have this true confession. But I want you to know, secondly, that the second foundational principle is that the Lord's church has a timely construction. A timely construction. Here's what I mean by that. Jesus says this, in verse 18, that upon this rock, I will build my church. Amen. Now this plainly states 
to anyone that believes the Bible as it is written that Jesus Christ is the builder of the church. Yeah. That the church was not built by the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost, nor was the church spiritually built in the Old Testament. Right. Uh, both of those answers would require an allegorizing of this text that is inconsistent with its context. Amen. He said, I will build my church. The true church was literally built by a literal builder. Well, if Jesus Christ built the church, and we know that his earthly ministry was some 2,000 years ago, well, that just dates the church, does right. it not? Amen. And therefore, we know that anything coming after Jesus' ministry cannot be this church. Right. And anything that claims to have originated before is an imposter. Amen. Because the church of Jesus Christ was built by the Lord himself during Amen. his Amen. earthly ministry. Amen. I want you to know that he said he was going to build it, and the location he gave was upon this rock. Like any good builder, Jesus Christ had a solid foundation. Amen. And Jesus is not referring to the confession of Peter in verse 16. Though that was a founding principle, and I don't believe I need to uh, go through the words that Peter used here, or that Jesus used here in the original. I know you've heard that before, uh, but let me just remind you that Jesus was not referring to Peter right. Right. as the rock. What a terrible rock. I think if, if Brother Larry went out and uh, denied the Lord three times, I think you'd probably reconsider having him as your pastor, right. would you not? But yet that's who some people believe was uh, the rock upon which the church was built. Uh, but I want you to know that Scripture, not only here in this passage, but all throughout the continuity of the New Testament, consistently affirms that Jesus Christ himself was the foundation Amen. and the rock upon which the church was built. Amen. Matthew 21, 42. He is the stone which the builders rejected that has become the head of the corner. Amen. Ephesians 2, 20. The church was built upon the foundations of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. Right. Uh, hey, how about this? Peter himself says in 1 Peter 2, 7, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same was made the head of the yeah, corner. Man. Uh, 1 Corinthians 3, 11, for other foundation can no man lay that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. You say, why are you so passionate about these truths? Why are you so fired up about these doctrines? Well, one of the reasons is because uh, I think that it's just so plain to Amen. anyone who just reads the scriptures Amen. and takes them for what they are, uh, and it just jumps off the page at you. Mm -hmm. Amen. Yet it seems that these beliefs are so scarce in our day. Mm. Mm. I, I'm not... Uh, I'm not rolling out a six foot long chart and using a bunch of Greek words that none of you know the meaning of to try to prove some intricate doctrine. I'm simply just quoting to you verses from Amen. the Word of God. Amen. And it's very clear here that the foundation for the New Testament church is not a type, it is not a shadow, but it is the reality of the person of Jesus Christ. He also states a divine owner of the church. He says that he was going to build my church. He, he did not say, I'm going to build a church. Right. He didn't say, I'm going to build the church. He said, I'm going to build my church. Amen. And see, I, I don't want any of you uh, to leave here tonight. I, I don't want any uh, godly Christian to stand before the Lord and have the Lord say, now how come, even though I made it so plain in my word, how come you went and joined some other man's church? Why didn't you join my church? Now now you can come on in, because you're saved and you're washed in the blood, uh, but, but you know, you kind of wasted many years of your life not serving me in the way that I had prescribed, because yeah. you, you wouldn't join my church. Mm -hmm. Oh, there's so much blindness that is right. taking place. I, I think just as Many in the Old Testament, you know, uh, there was the great apostasies that took place in Israel, and, and, and the entire ten northern tribes forsook 
the service of God. Right. You say, why did Israel get carried into captivity before Judah? Why did Israel see no revivals, yet Judah had five good kings? You want to know why that was? Well, what was the house of God in the Old Covenant? What, what was the appointed means of service in the Old Covenant? It was the temple. Tell me where the temple was. Was it not in Jerusalem? Amen. But yet the ten northern tribes forsook the appointed means of service. All right. Mm, my, my. See, I'm not saying that we don't have types. I'm not saying that we don't have shadows. I, I, I'm not saying, as the dispensationalist does, that the church is merely a parenthesis that no one uh, knew about. No, but I'm saying that it's the culmination of those types. Amen. It's the fulfillment of those shadows. And we don't know, we no longer have the type. We have the substance, which is the church. Amen. And we have an altar that they would serve the tabernacle have no right to partake in. But we have the fullness. We have the reality. Yeah. And I want you to know that when Jesus said that it is my church, he authoritatively stated that he was the head of the church. He has complete and unrivaled authority over his church. Amen. Ephesians 1.22 says that God hath put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church. Now I want to give you three ways in which Jesus Christ is the head of the church. Number one, Christ is our head spiritually. Mm -hmm. He is the author and finisher of our faith. Amen. Uh, he is the one that has redeemed us. He is the one that has saved us. And our fellowship, anything we have in common, is in the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. You know, I've traveled far and wide, and I've gone to some places uh, where I have nothing in common, humanly speaking, with any of the people in that assembly except for the blood of Christ. Amen. Amen. I've gone to foreign countries where I don't know the language, I don't know the culture, but they are saved by the same Savior. Amen. Amen. And so he's our head spiritually. Uh, but secondly, I want you to see that he is our head doctrinally. All of our teachings, all of our beliefs, all of our practices must originate with the scriptures. Mm -hmm. You know, we've always been considered people of the book. And let me tell you this, that uh, that used to be a derogatory term. Right. Because we insisted upon having the Word of God in the common language. All oh, those people of the book. Mm -hmm. We didn't trust a, a man to interpret it for us. Yeah. But we wanted to hold it. We wanted to handle it for ourselves. And, and we believe that this is the sole authority for the believer. And that all we will ever need for life and godliness comes out of this book. Amen. There's no question in your Christian life that can't be answered by the Word of God. Right. And Christ is our head doctrinally as he gives us the Word of God. But in the church, he's our head doctrinally also because he is the one that personally commissioned us our ordinances and gave us the command to evangelize the Amen. world and make Amen. disciples of every nation. And we have no authority. We are not authorized to do anything at, as his church that is not in accordance with his word. Amen. Amen. But thirdly, and, and this is where we lose a whole lot of people, mm -hmm. because not only is he our head spiritually, not only is he our head doctrinally, but Jesus Christ is our head governmentally mm -hmm. and historically. Amen. Uh, this is the distinguishing claim of the true church. You see, other churches, even though they, they, they're wrong about it, but they'll say, well, we get all of our doctrine from the Bible, too. Uh, well, we, we have fellowship because we're all born-again believers, too. Uh, but only the church of the Lord Jesus Christ can claim him as their head governmentally and as their head historically. Right. Amen. See, the true church does not, nor have they ever claimed any man, council, or convention outside of themselves as their authority. The true church answers directly to Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Uh, the true church is not under the authority of Rome. The true church is not under the authority of Mecca. And it sure ain't under the authority of Nashville. Amen. Amen. The Lord's church has no earthly founder. The no point of origin that postdates the ministry of Jesus Christ and no governing authority apart from Christ and his word. Amen. Amen. 
That's the church that Jesus built. Right. He is the head. We answer to him and to him alone. Uh, there's a preacher that got in some hot water a couple of years ago over some of the things that he said. And uh, the, he was in a very liberal community out in California, and he was a Baptist pastor, and they began to protest his church, and they, they put up online petitions to have him removed, and, and they would call the church, and, and they would say, we want to speak to the pastor's boss, we want to get him fired, and he would answer the phone, and he would say, I'll tell you just how to speak to my boss, you get down on one knee, and you, you fold your hands like this, and, and you begin to pray, because that's my only boss. Amen. He's the head of the church. Amen. All right. There's a timely construction. I want you to see thirdly, there is a territorial character. And now the word church very literally means a called out assembly. And if there is no assembly, there is no church. Right. Therefore, uh, the true church must be local and it must be physical. Amen. Amen. And you know, really, the, the term local church is kind of like saying wet water. Mm -hmm. It's a redundant statement. Right. But yet we have to use yeah. those redundant statements to uh, guard ourselves from being identified with all of the heresy that's being taught in our pulpits yeah. today. You say, how did we get so far from what Christ clearly instituted? Well, you know, he prophesied that there was to come a great falling away. And the way that the Apostle Paul structured it, whether you believe this or not, he said that the spirit of Antichrist was already working in his day. It was already beginning. Amen. See, some people are still looking for this great falling away. Now, they're still looking for this man of sin to be revealed. Uh, but Paul said that there was only one thing that hindered, and he was about to pass away. Mm -hmm. Uh, these things are revealed to those who have wisdom to understand. And there we see in about the third century, uh, we see churches that compromised on the autonomy of the local body. They began to form conventions and councils. Right. And there was a congregation uh, headquartered in Rome that rose to the standard. See, that's the problem with conventionalism, mm -hmm. is it sacrifices Amen. the autonomy of the local church right. by necessity. Uh, you cannot have three equal heads. There must be one that rises. There must be one that comes to the position of leadership. And, and so if we're not careful, we sacrifice local autonomy. And this church in Rome began to proclaim uh, that it was the universal church. As dissenters would rise, Augustine, and when he would debate the Donatists, uh, he would use this doctrine of the universal church to try to put them outside of the Lord's program, to try to treat them like the red-headed stepchild. And he, would, he would do away with, with uh, their doctrine of baptism, even though they were claiming to simply believe that they got their teachings from the scriptures. And so Rome began to have all of these councils and uh, all of these uh, these meetings, they would come out with all of these doctrinal statements. And by the way, this, this isn't in the notes, but I, I want to just let you know tonight, I, I'm often uh, criticized for preaching too hard against the, the Roman poor. But let me tell you this, in the Council of Trent, which has never been rescinded, the Rome said that if anybody believed that salvation was by grace through faith alone, they were anathema maranatha. Hmm. So, you know, you, you want to... You want to say you ought to be more nice to, to the Roman Catholic Church. Well, they think you're accursed. Right. Mm -hmm. They think you're lost and going to hell. Why? Right. Uh, because you haven't submitted to what they have taught. Mm -hmm. yeah. You're right. The problem is you can't find uh, their teaching before uh, their church originated. That's right. That's it. And so Rome then began a bloody reign of terror, uh, which lasted a century scattering and killing and persecuting true believers claiming to be 
the single, universal, and visible church. Uh, they still hold to this ecclesiology today. Uh, that's why if they, even though they plant one of their uh, centers in uh, Dover, Tennessee, they'll still call themselves Roman Catholics. Well, well if, we, if we were to send out a missionary and plant a church in Wisconsin, uh, we wouldn't call ourselves Tennessean Baptists. Right. Why? Because we don't have an earthly headquarters. We have a heavenly headquarters. Amen. Well, then around the year 1517 came the Reformers. Right. And now the Reformers are called Protestants, which simply means one who protests. And I'm glad that God gave at least some of those men the true gospel. And I'm thankful for that. Uh, but they were trying to protest. They were trying to reform. But, you know, what you really can't do is reform that old harlot. Amen. Uh, You're she, right. she won't be reformed. Right? Amen. Amen. And uh, just like they had so treated the Donatists and the other Anabaptist groups, uh, they began to then say, well, if you reject us, you are out of the Lord's church. You have no authority to baptize. You have no authority to meet. See, they understood church authority, but they did not understand what the church was. That's it. Amen. <laughs> and so the reformers came out with this idea that no, no, you've had it all wrong. Uh, the true church, well, it's universal, but it's invisible. It's made up of those who are spiritually born again and have received the Lord Jesus Christ. And they created the doctrine of the universal, invisible church to justify the Reformation, to legitimize their protesting of Rome. But the problem with the universal invisible church theory, and it is indeed a theory, is that you can't see it. There's no headquarters. There's no pastors. There's no deacons. There's no baptism. No Lord's Supper. Doesn't carry out the Great Commission. Takes up no offering. And it never assembles on earth. That's it. They call it the mystical church. Well, it's really more like the mythical church because it doesn't exist. <laughs> well, then... Somebody brought up the teaching there in Ephesians 4 that, hold on, wait a minute. Uh, how can you not have pastors or deacons? How can you not have any of these things? They said, well, uh, well, there's really two bodies. See, there is the invisible body, but it manifests itself in local assembly. So there, there's two bodies. There's the visible and invisible church. I've, I've heard lectures. I've heard sermons. I've, I've read books on this supposed invisible, visible church distinction. Well, as far as I'm concerned, and as far as anybody that believes the Bible should be concerned, the Apostle Paul forever settled that dispute in Ephesians 4 when he said there's one Lord, one faith, one baptism, and only one body. Amen. You see, there's not two bodies. One visible, one invisible. There's one body. You know, when Paul was speaking to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 12, 27, he says, now ye are the body of Christ. He, he didn't say you're part of the body. You are just a manifestation of the body. But no, but they were the fullness of Christ's body. They were not a toe. They were not an eyelash. And they were not an ankle. They were the whole body. And how can merely part of the body fulfilled the commission. Right. Because all these churches, though not claiming to be the totality of Christ's body, will say that it is their assembly's responsibility to fulfill the commission. Well, you can't do that unless you've got a full body. That's right? it. Amen. And this generic usage of the word should not confuse any of us. Uh, we use this terminology all the time. Uh, see, they try to trip you up uh, using the wisdom of men uh, when it's just simple foolishness. For instance, if I said to you today that uh, the American automobile is responsible for 40,000 deaths a year. Well, you have to be a crazy man to think that there is some giant Cadillac out, out on Highway 79 running 40,000 people over every year. No, you clearly understand that I'm just talking about generic American automobiles, American automobiles in general. And so when I say the church that Jesus built, I'm using that in the institutional and generic sense. And, and sometimes, actually only a handful of times, you'll find that usage of the word in the scriptures. Uh, but a majority of the time, it simply just says the church is. 
the church which is at so and so. This right. is we are today sitting in the church which is at Dover. Amen. See, there is this timely construction, but there is this territorial character. It is a local body. It is a visible body, and, and, and really. Uh, if you can grasp that, if you can understand that, and understand the importance of that, uh, everything else will fall into place. You, you will be amazed at how much doctrine and theology, things that you, you found so difficult to understand, suddenly they'll begin to fall into place once Amen. you understand Amen. what the church is. But I want you to see, we just talked about the founding principle. I want you to also see tonight that there is a future perpetuity. You see, thus far we have examined the founding principles that distinguish the true church that Jesus built from irregular churches. Uh, but I want you to note the promise here in Matthew 16. I'm going to ask you to turn to several portions of Scripture, and then we'll be done this evening. He said that he was going to build his church, but then he said this, that the gates of hell should not prevail against his church. What does Jesus believe about the church? Well, Jesus believes that his church would be perpetual from that day Amen. that he built it down through all of human history. Amen. You know, in verse 18 here, the church is on the offense, not the Amen. defense. Right. Uh, this Amen. promise is not that the church will be able to withstand the attacks of hell, though it will. Uh, but this promise is that when the church is faithfully carrying out the work of Christ, the gates of hell will not be able to withstand the attacks of the Lord's church. Amen. All power of hell's demons cannot resist the omnipotent Lord working through his church. Amen. Uh, the Catholics tried to exterminate us. The Protestants continued with the persecution, yet, bless God, we remain to this day. Amen. Amen. Why? Because Jesus promised that somewhere on this earth there would be a local, visible body of baptized believers that observed all things whatsoever he commanded from Advent to Advent. Amen. And although many Baptists are scared of this doctrine and they shy away from it because of the condemnation that they receive from others, we must not let this promise of our Lord fall by the wayside. Amen. So I want to give you a few reasons tonight of uh, why this doctrine is so important and why you must continue to believe and teach it. The first is this, the Great Commission. I'm not going to ask you to turn there, but you'll recall in Matthew 28 Amen. that the Lord gave us the commission to go into the world, to make disciples, and to baptize them. And then he said this, I will be with you always, even until the end of the world. Amen. Well, the Lord Jesus did not commission a parachurch organization. Sure. The Lord Jesus did not commission uh, a, a committee or a convention. He did not commission a Bible college to fulfill the Great Commission. But he commissioned his assembly, his church, and what the Great Commission is, is a reproductive cycle of New Testament churches. Amen. And in order for the commission to be fulfilled, then there must be evangelism, there must be baptism, and there must be churches, or there is no fulfilling of the Great Commission. And what happens when we as his true churches uh, neglect to fulfill the commission and Amen. we turn it over uh, to parachurch organizations, and I don't care if they call themselves right. Baptist Mission Boards, right. if they're not the Church of the Lord Jesus Christ, they were not given this commission, Amen. and then we see that the Great Commission devolved into some pagan Arminian recruitment program. Amen. Repeat after me. One, two, three. Amen. These, these types of programs cannot, uh, cannot fulfill the Great Commission. Amen. They cannot plant biblical churches. You're right. And their evangelism, uh, nine times out of ten, strays from what we see Christ giving to his church. I, I'm sorry, but you know, walking up to someone and saying, oh, excuse me, sir, your, your shoe's untied. Uh, and while you're bent over tying your shoe, if you just repeat after me, Lord, now I know that I am a sinner. And that's not evangelism. Nope. Amen. The Great Commission. Secondly, the reason why the doctrine of perpetuity is so important is this gospel truth. Look at 1 Timothy 3 in chapter number 15. 1 Timothy 3 in chapter number 15. The Bible says this. 
Uh, but if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God. Amen. Listen at this, the house of God, which is the church of the living God. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, this we, we've already covered, but let me just say while we're here, uh, I don't understand why anybody would need a code of behavior for an invisible assembly. Mm -hmm. Good. Uh, but we need to know how we are to behave spiritually in the house of God. And then it says this, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of, of truth. Amen. You know, Christ did not commission uh, his word, nor did he give the gospel to anyone other than his church. Right. And when we say that as the Protestants do, that the Roman Catholic Church was the true church, but it apostatized. Well, then after that Roman apostasy, well, until the Reformation, uh, they would have to admit that the church was lost. And that institutionally, now I believe there were believers all throughout that period, but they would have to admit that institutionally there was no assembly that believed the gospel. Gospel truth, the second reason. He said it was the faith once delivered to the saints. Amen. But I want you to see also gospel ordinances. We already mentioned that baptism was one of those ordinances given in the Great Commission. But I want to point out to you also that in 1 Corinthians 12, when the Lord's Supper was instituted, our Lord said, For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. Amen. He didn't say till the church apostatizes and you're no longer observing the ordinances. He didn't say that. So I believe that when the Lord comes back, his assembly, somewhere on this earth, uh, will still be observing this ordinance Amen. of the Lord's Supper. Amen. So, you know, I said at the beginning of the message that, yes, it does concern me that I don't see many people my age believing and loving these truths. But, but at the end of the day, I'm not worried because the Lord himself has promised that he's going to perpetuate Amen. these truths. Amen. I pray that he would use our circles to do it. I pray he would use me to do it. I pray he would even use uh, this country and the, the southern region of America to do it. Uh, but I, I, those things he did not promise. Right. But he did promise he was going to prepare. Amen. 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 Uh, I want you to see also the glory and honor of Christ. Turn with me to Luke chapter number 14. Luke chapter number 14. Now remember that he promised to build his church, and he promised that it, the gates of hell would never prevail against it. Now, that's not to individual assemblies. If we apostatize, if we forsake the truth, uh, our candlestick can be removed. Amen. Uh, but there will be a church somewhere. Amen. That was the promise of Jesus. Remember that. Now let's read Luke 14, verse 28. Jesus gives this parable, For which of you, intending to build a tower, sitteth not down first, and counteth the cost, Amen. whether he have sufficient to finish it? Lest happily, after he hath laid the foundation, and is not able to finish it, and behold, it, it began to mock him, saying, This man began to build, and was not able to finish it. I'm going to say something that sounds strong, but I believe that it is the truth. Uh, when those people say that the Roman church was the true church and it apostatized until the Protestants came along, they are no better than the people here that are mocking Jesus because they're saying he didn't count the cost when he built the church. Mm -hmm. They're saying he built it, but he didn't have sufficient to finish it, right. and it apostatized and fell away, and we have to recover the truth. Mm -hmm. But when we believe that about the church, no wonder we have the Mormons believing what they do. Right. All their creeds are an abomination. Yeah, don't join any of their churches. They're all false. Well, maybe most of them were. But old Joey Smith, just like uh, mm -hmm. neither did John Calvin or Martin Luther, they did not recover the church. Yeah. The true church never needed to be reformed. Yeah. Uh, the true church uh, never needed to be reinstituted. It never went through Rome. It was never a part of Rome. Amen. But it always existed, I believe, the promise of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. The glory and the honor of Christ. No, Jesus says unto him 
The Bible says unto him, that is Jesus Christ, be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, yeah. world without end. That's it. Amen. And, and, and lastly tonight, and this is part of the Great Commission, but I want to give it special emphasis, is the preaching of the gospel and evangelism. I'm going to read to you two verses here from Revelation chapter number 22. Revelation chapter number 22. Jesus says this. I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify. This is verse 16. I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bride and morning star. Verse 17, pay close attention. And the spirit and the bride say come. Amen. Now, I'm not saying that only Baptists can preach the gospel. I'm not saying that only the Lord's true church can evangelize the lost. Because he goes on to say, and let him that hear him say come. But who's really uh, moving in the power corporately of the Holy Spirit? Uh, the Holy Spirit indwells and always has indwelled every true believer in God. Amen. Always. But the Holy Spirit only corporately indwells one assembly, and it is Amen. the Lord's church. Amen. And the Lord clearly here identifies his church as his bride. You see, I, I wanted to be like Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ, well, he has a Baptist bride, and I wanted one too, so I married yeah. Abigail. <laughs> she's, she's giving me that look, so I better stop. You know, one time I was preaching, and she gave me that look, and I ducked, and, and she froze the baptistry. <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> Now, I've gone too long tonight, but I do want you to understand that I care about I care about these things. Amen. I'm going to ask you a question. Ephesians 5:25 says that Christ loved the church and gave Himself for it. Amen. I, I don't believe this is universal either. You see, because Him giving Himself meant more than just His death. Yes, thank God it meant His death. But ask yourself this simple question. Who did Jesus spend most all of his time with during his earthly ministry? Who did he spend three and a half years teaching? Who did he eat with? Who did he love? Who did he fellowship with? Who did he commune with? It was his church. Amen. He gave himself bodily for the church. Right. Who Amen. are you going to give yourself to? Amen. Who are you going to spend your life serving? Better not be a man. Men can fail you. Better not be... Uh, some assembly that doesn't have this promise of perpetuity. What are you going to do uh, when that fades away and passes yeah, away? Right. Oh, but friend, let me promise you, if you commit yourself to serving the Lord's church, serving the Lord through His church, you'll always have a place of service. Amen. You'll always have meaning. You'll always have purpose. Amen. He loved the church, gave Himself for it. I beseech you to do the same. Let's pray. Father, we thank you tonight for your glorious gospel. Amen. Lord, we love you, and we praise you tonight, and Lord, I hold these truths so near and dear to my heart, and I thank you for revealing them to me, and I thank you for this body of believers that has likewise come to have, uh, understand something of these truths. Lord, I love you, and I thank you, and I confess your lordship in Jesus' name tonight. Amen. Amen.